All right, so welcome back to the last few lectures we have left in the semester. Uh, time flew by. I really enjoyed this. It was a really fun experience for me. I hope you had uh, at least half as good a time as I did doing this. So let's, uh, I was thinking we talk about the three papers um, today and some of the context around them. And these were so all interesting because they were controversial or dramatic in some way. I thought they were, um, it would be a good way to reflect on uh, everything we've discussed this past semester and on how no method is perfect or flawless, no study is ever flawless, and how there's behind all of these studies, there's always humans with um, human biases and, and preferences and politics sometimes and all of these human things that make us human and interesting and how despite probably our best efforts most of the time it's often hard to separate the science the sort of pure science from the context around it and the interpretation of of that science uh, so i thought this would be a nice way to kind of end the semester and, and talk about these how about so hopefully we have uh, volunteers um, leading the presentation of these three papers and um, how about we start with the mentorship one that was the one that was retracted so arguably the most dramatic of the three that uh, we have in store for today how about we start with this one i, I believe it was hana if i remember correctly mm -hmm. yeah yeah do you want to walk us through it and give us your thoughts on the paper and then we can have a conversation about it yeah sure i have um slides so if you could uh i don't know can i share my screen I, th I believe so, unless there's something I need to do. Okay. I think you should be able to. Okay. Thanks. Right. So, can you see the slides? Um, we can see the presentation now. Um, mm. Yikes. One second. Why is it nice? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right. I, I'll just go through the slides. I have some notes, but yeah. Um, yeah, so the this is the uh, retraction paper on the association between early career and formal mentorship and academic collaborations. Oh, sorry. Uh, and junior author performance. Um, yeah, so first I'm gonna talk about the original paper, um, what it discussed, what were the results, what were the methods, and you know, then later I'll go into the reactions and why it was eventually redacted. So initially um, the paper was uh, seeked out to study the effect of mentorship on junior uh, scientist careers. They defined junior scientists as those who had uh, submitted their first paper no more than seven years before. So everyone who had like seven years of some paper experience was considered junior and anybody above that was considered senior. Um, and the reason for this is, you know, they were focusing um, specifically on gender. And the reason for is that there had been previous studies showing that mentorship can alleviate entry barriers for minority groups, especially women and people of color by pairing them with someone more senior and helping them, you know, get an idea of academia, of the publication process, you know, which Ben used to go for, things like that. And uh, what this particular study aimed to do was look at millions of mentor prodigy pairs. There hadn't been one done on such a large um, scale before. And the way they um, defined these uh, pairings was through academic publication, so co-authorship, um, which we'll see later was a bit uh, was a bit of an issue. So uh, they went through um, paper citations. Uh, they created networks out of all of the papers, and that's how they got uh, an idea of who was a mentor and who was a protege. From uh, yeah, so they had a data set of scientific publications and citation networks for each of these uh, papers. So within different um, sections of academia, sort of, uh, there was computer science, engineering, geology, biology, those sort of things. Um, they would look at those disciplines, the participants' genders between both the mentors and the protégés and university rank. Um, and the university was the uh, I forgot what the ranking was, but it was a particular ranking. Um, and it did ex exclude some scientists. I have I had in my notes the specific reasons, but I can't 
see those right now. And um, yeah, so they analyzed over 200 million papers, over 200 million uh, authors, and they ended up um, pulling out 3 million mentor protege pairs. And from these pairs, they used a uh, gender analysis tool on their names to figure out what the genders were. And uh, of these 3 million, they reached out to, I believe, 2,000 junior scientists that they um, were able to email. Um, and uh, they got 167 survey responses from those scientists on five different skills that ideally a junior scientist should be able to learn from their mentors and some statements about their advisors. And so this was uh, some of the survey results. So um, A and B, so A is the, um, these are the five, lay out the five skills. So writing, research study design, data analysis modeling, addressing reviewer comments and selecting a venue for publication. And the participants were asked, you know, how uh, their uh, distribution of agreeance between strongly disagree and agree. And then B is the distribution or proportion of participants saying that. C is, was a question like, which of these statements are true about your uh, collaborator, this case meaning their advisor. And uh, I received grant writing advice from him or her. I received a letter of recommendation, uh, career planning advice and uh, connections, so network advice as well. And D was also uh, the proportion of participants that uh, responded true to these statements. So- um, the, oh, Just to clarify, was this for, was this to validate the um, um, way they define mentorship based on these co-authorship relationships or was this for some other purpose? Um, I believe it was, I forget. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember exactly, but I don't think it was validation. I, they didn't talk about this. Um, to like, they didn't really take this into account in the rest of the paper. So maybe it was validation and setting it up. Um, they didn't really pull out any results from this section by itself, other than and they really looked at paper citations as the more defining result. But uh, this was to get a little bit more of an idea from the junior scientist standpoints. Yeah. Uh, but I can I can get back to you on that. And uh, yeah, so for their results, um, they had different metrics. So for the mentors, they looked at their impact and degree prior to mentorship. So prior to taking on their protégés, they looked at um, pretty much how big the um, each mentor was, like how you know how popular, how well known are they within their communities, and like. Do they, are, are they a professor at a great school or are they a researcher at a great company? How many papers do they have already? Those sorts of things. And also degree. So what, what is their level of uh, education? And then the, enter, the outcome for mentorship was average impact of papers published. And so for protege outcomes, one of the controversial statements that they came out with was, uh, having more female mentors is associated with a decrease in the mentorship outcome, and this decrease can reach as high as 35%. And this was through, uh, this was looking at citations. And um, mentor gain, so this was the idea that, oh, mentors can gain, uh, you know, collaborators, more research through uh, mentoring protégés. By mentoring female instead of male protégés, the female mentors compromise their gain from mentorship and suffer an average on average, a loss of 18% in citations on their mentor papers. As for male mentors, their gain does not appear to be significantly attacked, uh, sorry, uh, significantly affected by taking female instead of uh, male protégés. So, and they go on for the rest of the paper to discuss the reasons why this might be true. And they speculate that um, women may uh, be on more committees, may be doing more for you know, uh, other sort of outreach groups and bringing on more mentorships and their time may be spread thin, which would lead for them to spend less time on mentor on their protégés overall, whereas male mentors uh, didn't have as much of an issue and they already benefited a lot from uh, whatever academic institution they were at. And so, yeah, a lot of people had issues with those comments. Um, they also had these uh, graphs on the relationship between male protégés and number of mentors and relative uh, change in protégés impact. So this again, they measured this by citations. So how many, uh, what was like the increase in the number of citations for papers at the start of the mentorship and at the end of the mentorship. And uh, as we can see, according to their data, having 
um, sort of female proteges, especially with uh, women, was uh, with a woman mentor was uh, a big negative correlation. And then in C, they discuss the gain and essentially it's showing like a huge uh, loss for female mentors. Whereas male mentors, there's a little bit, but it's not, it's not nearly as drastic. And uh, yeah, so now on to the retraction. So when this paper, paper was published, there were a lot of issues. These are some of the uh, comments I pulled, uh, the more sort of uh, controversial ones. You don't have to read all of them, but some of my favorite lines are, uh, finally, we have peer review leverage to burn women that know math as witches, a custom wrongly discontinued with the coming of civilization. Um, another, um, another commenter said, suddenly I felt like I was in 1940, extremely shocked to read this publication. As a researcher, I feel this article is unacceptable and proves that academia is still an unfair, uneven, and unsafe place to work. Unfortunately, female intelligence is still considered a threat. So there was um, a lot of discussion, 73 comments total on the Nature article and lots of back and forth, a lot of people um, complaining about the results um, and like having sort of an emotional reaction to it as well as people um, questioning the co-authorship method which um, and the citations as the metrics that they used. And so this led to the journal running an investigation. Um, and so from the investigation, they were able um, to, yeah, the investigation ended up with it being retracted. So this is the sort of um, website, like when you get to the website of the article, this is what is at the top of the page. And it says the article was retracted on the 21st of December. And there's an editor's note um, saying that uh, these criticism, crit sorry, criticisms were targeted to the author's interpretation of their data that gender plays a role in the success of mentoring relationships between junior and senior researchers in a way that undermines the role of female mentors and mentees. We are investigating the concerned phrase and they say they'll they will have an editorial response to follow. And so uh, the authors then submitted a response after the investigation. So they the investigation found the primary issue was the use of co-authorship as a proxy of senior researchers mentor mentorship. And that was what was sort of reflected in all of the comments. And after the investigation, the they were three investigators and they all agreed that was the issue. And so the authors retracted the paper. And um, in their statement, you know, they discussed the controversy, the way they um, decided to, they, the way they pulled their results. And at the end, they write, we feel deep regret that the publication of our research has both caused pain on an individual level and triggered such a profound response for, among many in the scientific community. Many women have personally been extremely influential in our own careers and we express our steadfast solid act, solidarity within support of the countless women who have been a driving force in scientific advancement. We hope that the academic debate continues on how to treat to achieve true equity in science, a debate that thrives on robust and vivid scientific exchange. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it for the uh, paper itself and the retraction. And it was interesting because I saw this, I, I think Bob Dean, you shared it or, or Laura shared it when it initially came out. And um, I remember we were all very confused by the results. And so it was interesting to see that the you know, community around us and all like through all the comments that a lot of people had took a lot of issue with the results and how they were presented. And, Oh, there were also a lot of comments on, on sort of the reverse argument where like, oh, people are just butthurt about their, you know, results. Would you, would you say the same if it was the opposite way? If, if male protégés are like, you know, didn't um, succeed with male mentors. So it was sort of like a political aspect to it as well. So yeah, it was very interesting overall. And I'm interested to see how they're going to fix it or how they're going to I don't know, edit how they define mentorship. Um, so, so yeah. Thanks, thanks, Anna, for the summary. I, I'd love to hear what people think about this. So what was your take on, on the paper itself, on the study? This is a methods class. So what do you think about the methods and the study? Um, and what do you think about everything that happened around the publication and retraction of this paper? 
did we read this before? Um, you and I, I mean, and I think we read this in a group meeting or something like that. It's I'm possible. both nodding. I'm both nodding. Yeah, I, I remembered this. And I remember one of my issues with it was citations is just a weird metric for success, like in general. This is sort of like on literally everyone else except for you, right? <laughs> so, so if your community is inherently, you know, sexist, then obviously you're going to have fewer citations. Um, also, this whole thing about, you know, uh, co-publications being uh, indicators of mentorship. This is also like uh, Fraser, Fraser Brown just interviewed here, and I think most of her papers are not with her advisor, with Dawson Angler. And I asked her about this and she said, she loves Dawson, he's a great advisor, but he's highly principled and he doesn't believe that his name should be on papers that he didn't have a significant contribution to. And this is independent of mentorship. So he was a great mentor, but uh, some work, she just put in so much work without him that he didn't feel right putting his name on it. So already this is like, this is anecdotal, but it's like, it's an anecdote about where their metric falls apart for like both mentorship and citations. I just thought it was weird. Yeah, about citation, I also feel that it mostly depends on the field that you're working on. So many fields have like many of the works are going on and people cite each other, but uh, in some fields, maybe it's just booming and people are citing less. There are less people working on that story. So I don't feel citation has, uh, can be a measure of this thing also. Mm -hmm. Also, if your work is extremely novel or like particularly difficult to do, you're not, <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing something that no one's working on, you're not gonna have citations. Uh, I did like the, I do like this question of like, if they came up with the opposite result, would anybody care? Uh, because it's really weird. Um, I think if they came up with the opposite result, it would still deserve the same type of criticism, but I don't think it would get it. But it cuts both ways because, you know, the fact that it is not a, it, it's a bad look means that one of the criticisms will be, well, you just don't like the result. So I don't think, yeah. So it's hard. I don't know how to, how to deal with that problem. I, I want to hear more thoughts before I say anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy and Nadia. It seems like uh, another kind of big issue is just the, like the results exist in the interpretation that like a lot of people inter will interpret the results causally. Like, you know, if you want to have better mentorship, um, you should adhere to, you know, these gendered mentors and these gendered mentees. Um, and obviously that's not a causal claim that people should be making from the results of the data. And also the direction of it is like harmful to the community. So yeah, I, I think that the like harm proposed by the interpretation of the results is also a big issue. Yeah, I would agree with Ben. The paper does a lot of posturing towards uh, hinting towards a causal claim without making any claims of what could be a threat to the validity. And they don't really make any um, arguments as to, I guess, singling or trying to identify or trying to uh, identify if that's the only probable cause for um, this uh, like this correlation that we have here, so yeah, it, they're they're kind of they're skipping a lot of steps essentially. Mm -hmm. yes, I'm also confused about like on the first place, what is the base of taking gender as a variable in this thing? So it uh, like this experiment should have like, uh, whatever the result comes. Why would I take gender as a variable of uh, mentor-mentee relationship? So that is one big question for me. 
I, I guess because you're go ahead. Oh yeah, just to answer that because um, there had been like there was some previous research, not on such a large scale, that. Uh, just looking at the success of these mentorship programs. So are these uh, women helping women uh, mentorship programs successful at all? Do they help? And uh, I forget what, I remember the author was Lee. I didn't read the paper, it was citing myself, but there was some indication that it was a positive relationship and that the female mentee, um, you know, was able to progress and have a better academic career as a result. But their focus was, okay, how, they expanded, um, I forgot exactly how they expanded it, but they wanted to view more people on a larger scale. And the previous paper had been much more strict into what kind of mentor-mentee relationships they were looking at. Um, and so the reasoning was behind it. Okay, does this, does yeah, does this scale out eventually, uh, essentially? Yeah, still, I don't like understand that why would you have to test this kind of things in such a big scale or, or if when the success metrics are not like you can understand the uh, uh, success measures quite well. <laughs> I think it's because um, you want to, um, so there's a lot of um, evidence for um, all kinds of types of sexism, systemic or otherwise, in science and in other areas, look at the pay gap, for example, the gender pay gap in general in any profession. So that's just one, one example. Um, and I think if you can document empirically that this occurs and the extent to which it occurs in science, you can begin to make more informed policy decisions about how to correct this. If you, know, if you don't have any evidence about the presence and or extent of the problem, it's hard to work on solving it, I would think. So just the idea of documenting, quantifying empirically with uh, solid empirical evidence, ideally, right, that this exists, um, it seems like a first step towards addressing the problem. Sure, but... <laughs> From a critical theorist point of view, this is a nightmare because uh, the first of all, you just added something to the literature that says don't work with women, which is nuts. Uh, but also their conclusion wasn't about how much of this negative effect is. Uh, they didn't look at the at what it could be attributed to. They just said that women are less successful when they work at women. And that was their conclusion. And that's what and that was what they literally wrote in their conclusion. They didn't try to describe why. They don't know why. Um, it's not particularly shocking that you know women are underrepresented in science. And just saying that it's a disadvantage to work with a with a woman is kind of like it's not a great thing to say in a paper. Um, Hannah, was there anything in in the way of um, the, the authors hypothesizing about why this might be? Yeah. So they gave. Um... So afterwards, they had some very loose suggestions, but, um, and one of the things I forgot to comment on is that I think this paper would have been, it could have avoided this if it did some sort of qualitative research and actually talked to people. And it made all these sort of vague generalizations about why this could be. Um, and I mean, let me see if I could find any, but I remember they just, they just, hypothesize that um, with, like female mentors spend more time just on committees, um, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so back to Jeremy's question, it does seem like they made an attempt to speculate at least why this might be. Sure, but the, the last paragraph of like, the, the last paragraph in the paper essentially starts with the sentence, our gender related findings suggest that current diversity policies promoting female female mentorships, as well intended as they may be, could hinder the careers of women who remain in academia in unexpected ways. And this, <laughs> like if this is the only thing you read, the, the first sentence of the conclusion, which is typically, you know, the thesis of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It says that female-female uh, mentorships tend to harm women in science. 
Mm. Yeah, and yeah. they really. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, it's okay. I was just gonna say they even say that like they make these. Uh, they try to be explanatory, but then say these potential drivers are out of scope mm -hmm. <laughs> for their study, but they're not because um, it's very related to the the categorization of the number of citations a paper might get. Like they don't consider those additional factors, which are are very heavily related to the measure that they're basing their whole study around, which I think is a huge flaw. And I, I, I definitely agree with Hannah. I think that like if they had um, done some more qualitative or, mi or more mixed method work, I think that would be a different story. And to say that it's out of scope, I think that's like a huge flaw in their study. So let me sort of um, step back and, and push back for a second. Um, one of the things I am trying to do with this class, um, as advertised from the beginning, is um, instill a healthy dose of skepticism in you as scientists in general. So I think it'd be appropriate for me to make sure that um, you are skeptical in both directions. So the meta question here is, you know, it's it's easy to agree with the findings of a study that happens to agree with our politics or beliefs and easy to disagree with the findings of a study that happens to disagree with our politics or beliefs, right? It's just, we're, we're human, right? So, you know, um, we, we read something that we happen to uh, believe in or agree with, and we probably find it more credible. And uh, if it's in the opposite direction, we probably have this natural tendency to push back. So just for the sake of being healthily skeptical here, and so not just um, criticize the study because it happens to uh, disagree with uh, probably many of our beliefs. Um, so let, let me, so how, how do we separate these two, right? So how do we, um, like, what if the numbers actually point towards this effect that the study is probably wrongly advertising or claiming? What if those are the actual numbers? Like, what, what do we do as scientists and researchers if that's what comes out of the data analysis? Like, I guess the question is, how do we separate our own politics and beliefs from whatever the data says? Why should we? I mean, science can be a political act, it turns out. <laughs> but so that's a question, right? I'm asking this to the group. Uh, there are some that um, believe strongly that um, data is truth and everything else is subjective interpretation of politics. I think I agree more with Jeremy where like, our research exists in more context than just the data and the truth behind the data. So I think that we have to make sure, I don't know, we need to make sure that our methods are as, as strong as they could be um, to discover findings in the data. And then we absolutely need to be, have sections where we talk about the flaws in the methodology and how that and how the work and and how they should be overcome and how it might influence the results of the work and then we also need to talk deeply about how the work exists in the context of other environments i think those are sections that need to happen in papers like this and and this one doesn't have mm -hmm. has not done a thorough job in doing that and i think that's where it really falls short can i rephrase that to say that we should hold papers like studies like this one, which is on a sensitive topic to a higher standard of uh, research rigor or scientific excellence than say average papers on some more, I don't know, technical topics or, or things like that? It, it seems to me like there's the issue of like, you know, false positive results versus, you know, false negative results. And, you know, if this, if the results of a study um, that's 
I think if the results of a study have like negative consequences to, I guess, the community as a whole, then you should kind of raise the bar for the type of quality of research that you're accepting. Who do, who do you think should decide on that? Who gets to who gets to make this call if the consequences may be negative and so on? Is that on the authors? Is it on the reviewers? Like who who is this on? Who gets to decide this? Is it on the IRB? I think it's on everyone, every step of the way. The researchers should have been more careful with not declaring, you know, causality out of scope. And the reviewers probably should have caught this. But uh, also, I mean, you know, the readers of what was the science, the readers of science, you know, also were effective at doing their job, which is calling out BS and coming up with a retraction for this. Because I, I don't necessarily, I don't find the conclusion surprising necessarily, but the way that it's, uh, the way that it's presented is really dangerous. You're just giving sites to misogynists, saying don't ever work with women, and saying don't worry about the cause, just don't do this. And that's kind of crazy. So pushing back still. Um, so, so it seems like the core counter argument to the study is the um, flawed definition or operationalization rather of, of mentorship as co-authorship of, of papers right um and so you nadia and jeremy you pointed out two things so nadia pointed out that the domain may make a huge difference here uh, so citations citation practices vary widely maybe between domains so that's important to control for and jeremy you gave an anecdote of somebody who has some particular um i don't know co-authorship pattern so i guess what what if uh, so i back to hannah uh, did, was there any attempt to control for the domain that these papers were coming from uh was or was it just sort of uniformly analyzed across all of the different domains in the data set yeah, they just mentioned that they looked at different pairs from different domains, but there was no mention of we're going to consider these uh, these sort of metrics differently across domains. And yeah, Nadia and Jeremy bring up a great point. And I think, you know, a lot of people here would agree that just citations is not an accurate, you know, scale of like what makes a successful mentorship. And just talking to research, like people in these these mentorships and asking them to define, you know, what is success in a ment mentorship and what, you know, what do you gain from it? And they sort of attempted to do that with the survey, just talking to um, junior people, but it wasn't really, they didn't, the questions that they posed to them are like, what, what are the skills that you got out of this? What are the, what are these statements are true about your mentor? So they had these predefined, they had or had a predefined idea of what makes a successful mentorship without actually getting much input or much opinion from the people themselves and that you know brings that translates into the results where you know they stuck with this mentality and they you know formed their results around it where if they had more input from the community from everyone around it um you know it would be a different story so re rephrasing this can i say that mentorship is broader than co-authorship but what if what if we just uh, find replace in the paper the word mentorship for something narrower that better reflects the measure um the collaboration on on research studies and and publications right and then the um, conclusion as stated by the authors would be along the lines uh you shouldn't co-author papers you shouldn't collaborate on research papers with uh, women right that um instead of you shouldn't mentor women like would would that be okay then not politically but would that be okay scientifically there can be a lot of other factors that can be affecting at that point. So you need to like, um, uh, like you need to take 
consideration all the other factors and remove the effects and then you can come to such conclusions great what you... okay so what if i control for domains for example i uh, analyze each domain of science separately or subdomain of science separately or control for that somehow in my analysis um, on the one hand and because i have so much data i'm looking at these millions of pairs i'm going to make the big data argument the patented big data argument and say you know all of these anecdotes like the one jeremy mentioned they, they all occur they're all valid but are they the trend or are they just sort of anecdotes that happen occasionally right so could i just say that you know all of these um uh, infrequent by definition anecdotal uh, patterns of collaboration that somehow break the mold that i'm that i'm looking at could i just think of all of these as random noise that sort of adds just sort of uh, dilutes my signal in the data and you know if, if even with these in there uh, if there's a true effect of uh, i don't know uh, co-authoring uh, papers with women junior women if there's still an effect of that thing there, I should still be able to detect it, even if there's some sort of noise introduced by these unusual co-authorship patterns. Would, would that make it okay? I can remember the paper that you showed us that how data can be very misleading about the code review uh, in the Microsoft. So uh, maybe the data is saying something different, but when you go for the underlying cause of it, or you talk to people uh, and try to understand why this data is showing these things, then maybe you can be able to validate the things and represent something uh, with more reasoning and something else. So the data cannot be. So let's know. say I, I did all of this. Uh, I do a better job with my analysis and my data collection. And I don't call this mentorship, which is maybe much broader than what I'm measuring. I call it something much more specific and closer to the operationalization. Let's say I do all of that and I still end up with the same results of the data analysis what do i do then do i do i publish this do i um like you know forget about why i was studying this in the first place we could have that conversation too i mean that's fine um but i'm asking very specifically you know let, let's say i ended up doing all of this and the data after a more careful analysis points in this unexpected direction that's contrary to my beliefs or politics what do i do so I think it's fair to state the court, like to state the correlation that you found. I don't think it's fair to make claims about like causal statements without doing like an actual causal analysis as what they've done. So I, I think it would be fair to say that, oh, maybe citations, um, maybe female authors do have like lower citations and such, but then, th then it wouldn't be fair for them to say, oh, because of this, you should not do this or like make any um, claims about how to interpret the data after that. Because it's one thing to state what you find in the data, but another thing to um, interpret it or, or like um, make assumptions and like conclusions from the data. That requires a different step. Back to Jeremy's comment. Um wouldn't i still be giving ammunition and fuel to the misogynists even if i write this up as a correlational study without overclaiming causality like wouldn't wouldn't that be uh misread as you know evidence that this relationship is causal even if i'm not explicitly claiming it's causal wouldn't it just be misread as causal anyway i think it could be misread but at this point, if you know the authors are specific and going back and you know they think their data is sound, you know one of the things and sort of the recommendations is that we, the community, the scientific community, who, who you know whatever the sort of um, if it's biology or computer science or whatever the environment, we need to have a community discussion to try to make it more equitable. And of course, you're going to have misogynists who, you know, say we don't care, but it's up to us to uphold a certain standard within our own communities and to make it known that, you know, everyone should have a fair chance. And if there are any issues, if for whatever reason, you know, male protégés suffer or female protégés suffer, you know, trying to understand why and then working as a community to fix that, you know, however we, you know, try to do that is very important. It's what you do after the paper and 
you know, if you're going to make this discussion within the community, you should try to, you know, have recommendations, have actions, so there's a place to move forward to from it. But isn't it the case that the, ultimately the general consumers of all of this research are the general public, so beyond the research community, or you know, the people that are most likely to um, misinterpret research findings and conclusions are just the general public, the popular media and so on that pick this up uh, without reading the fine print. Um, and then to the general public after that, um, less so than the research communities. Like even if you know, we're, we're able to maybe spend the time, put the effort into reading the fine print, could we still avoid the fallout from something like this? I don't, I've been thinking, I don't think there's a good blanket rule for publishing purely correlational studies like this one and just saying, oh, get the data out there, it's good. I think you do have to think about the conclusion that's gonna be reached. So it's good to publish correlations between things like uh, lemons and scurvy because people reach a conclusion here that is generally helpful and not harmful. But doing something like this, where people reach a conclusion that like would have a negative effect on the universe, it might actually be more irresponsible to do that, to publish a correlational study without any investigation into causality if, the, if people's reactions are going to be something bad. How do we decide on that? How do we decide if something's going to have negative consequences on the universe? Are we equipped to do that just on our own? In this case, I think yes. <laughs> it's pretty obvious, right? Don't work with women. I mean, it's okay, but um, first, what if it's more subtle? What if, uh, for whatever reason, you know, it's not something I have been trained to recognize as harmful? Um, It sounds like that's more in the realm of misinformation, fake news, because what you're kind of suggesting is that, you know, people can take the bad results, don't read the fine print and just, you know, put it out there and people, you know, who aren't scientists and who aren't researchers won't really look at this and they'll just run with the title. And that goes into it, for me, sort of a different realm. And we still, we don't know today, we're like lots of people are doing research now, but um, I think the best way is to make it as explicit as possible you know, what are the limitations? What are the implications? You know, like this paper, for example, didn't discuss, you know, their limitations that much. They had very few. And that's, you know, why all this hailstorm sort of, you know, came from it. Um, yeah, so being responsible about how you, to the best of your ability, people, you know, someone can always take it and run with it. But, you know, for the people who actually care enough to go read the article and look at it, who are the people who are actually really invested in it, um, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's important for them to like have the responsibility to be as explicit and transparent with your research as possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with this. I think, I think the, um, the study could have been done more carefully and written up more carefully. Um, the, the question I am personally still struggling with is what if we had done all of that? I can I can see that happening. Um, but what if what if we had done all of that, uh, done the study as carefully as anyone could, and still this is what came out, like something that's so potentially harmful and so contrary to uh, many people's beliefs and and, and politics. What, what do you do? Like, um, what do you do with this? And how do you even t talk about this? How do you write, how do you even write this up? You don't declare causality out of scope. You just don't do it. But do you, do you give up and, and not decide not to publish? Probably, yeah. <laughs> so Isn't that interesting? But then you're not successful because you get no pub <laughs> if you don't publish. No, nobody can cite an unpublished paper. <laughs> So I guess, Bogdan, you made a point earlier how saying you need to identify the the issue before you can solve or 
you need to highlight the issue before you can solve it. So I, I don't like, yeah, there are issues of not, um, I guess people taking it, people misinterpreting your data, but if you want to take a step into solving the problem, then you should at least highlight the problem. Um, it, it's kind of similar to, I know it, it's, it's not really in the same scope, but it reminds me of how there's like aspect, aspect programming, um, how that was a big field. And then there was that one paper that came out saying that no one uses this. <laughs> and uh, that, 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 got, that garnered a lot of hate, but it was, it was kind of the turning point in saying, or which is why no one kind of looks at aspect-oriented programming anymore. So um, yeah, I, I, even though it might be controversial, I think it's still worth to publish them. Yeah, I, so I agree with that. I think one option that the authors could have at least considered is maybe pushing it through a different type of conference that's geared toward these types of discussions that's better equipped to handle them. So I'm thinking, I don't know exactly what it would, would have been for them, but like a, a women in computing and engineering type of forum that could look at this um, from a different aspect and uh, maybe it would be better trained to handle some of the sensitivities of it. Because mm -hmm. um, I think the information is useful, you know, assuming you're you know, doing everything correctly, it's useful. And pushing it through a different type of journal or conference, um, I think the discussion could be better, more useful, more sensitive so as an option. So I guess you're, you're hinting at this being um, a shared responsibility of, of not just the authors, but of the reviewers more generally to, or authors and reviewers to consider all the implications of, of something like this? It's, it's interesting because it's sort of, it, I think very quickly uh, goes down the slippery path of free speech and so on, where um, you could decide to gatekeep based on politics and beliefs, something that appear, this is not the case here, but let's assume that um, you could have done the study as carefully as anyone could, and, and this is what came out. Um, so it's, it's interesting, right? Because somebody can decide that you can't, you can't publish something like this just because they disagree with the conclusions. To be clear, I don't think we're anywhere there with this particular study. I think there's lots of things that should have been done better to, to this study to make it more believable. I'm, I'm not arguing in favor of this study, but I, I can see an argument for um, you know, gatekeeping of science based on politics or beliefs. And you know, I, I don't know. I don't know where I stand on that. I, it's not. It seems a, a not obvious answer to me i mean i think that this paper got a lot of attention because of the subject matter and because of its political nature so it begs the question is like are these issues in other areas and we just haven't noticed because we don't think you know because they don't have this politicized nature but the sort of counter argument is that this is like these are more relevant, I think, to our day-to-day -day lives and, you know, for like to half of the population really for uh, this paper and in particular, and a lot of it, you know, there is a political aspect, but there's also, I think, an importance aspect, which is, and like a responsibility aspect that ties into that. And so for me, yes, it's, there's probably a bias in the response, but, you know, behind that bias, it's an importance to figure out this problem and, you know, work as a community to try to remedy it. Yeah, I, I guess my one, personally, my, my one take home from this is that it just seems impossible to separate 
the human researcher with their beliefs in politics from the very nature of the study itself, the de details of the study itself. Like it, it seems like as long as it will be human researchers doing research, we have no chance of uh, being objective and separating our own politics and beliefs from whatever is there in, in, in the data. Because, because ultimately it's on us, the writers of those papers to interpret those findings, to conclude something based on those numbers or whatever data we're analyzing. We have to interpret those somehow and draw some conclusions. And it seems like uh, from everything we've seen today and some other examples throughout the semester, that it's very easy to interpret something in, in different directions. Um, and I don't know if equally valid, but certainly one can argue for interpreting things in, in, in different directions. I think we will agree on that. I think it, uh, it makes me wonder if there's like a process thing that we could do where to the best of the author's ability with as many stakeholders as possible come to conclusions in the paper, but up to the, the community to refine those conclusions as it's more widely available, the results of the paper. Like, I feel like retraction in this case, because of how problematic some of the methodology in the paper was, I think was a good choice, but I wonder if there's as new interpretations of the data can be developed through different perspectives as the research is put out there, if there's a process in which the interpretations could be added on to in, in the findings of the paper. Uh, and I think that might be the only solution that I can come up with that sounds reasonable. Cause I, I think if in your, I, I kind of agree with you in that, like I think if the authors to the best of their ability were very careful. Uh, I think then even if the results were going against uh, theirs or others political beliefs, I think it's worthy to to publish the results. But I think that over time, being able to, to adjust the interpretations and findings based on new information, I think that would be the best, like, a better course of action, at least than just leaving it as is. Mm -hmm. So arguably that's exactly what has happened here. This process you're describing is what has happened, right? There's been community discussion and so on and um, change in outcome and some some result of that. So that, that has arguably happened. And otherwise, I, I agree with you. And I guess we're back to square one to, I don't know, lecture one the semester. So we've basically learned nothing. <laughs> Um, in that it seems like we can't ever do anything conclusive with any single study ever. Uh, it seems like the best we can hope for is for sort of long-term uh, aggregation of pieces of results from different studies and replications and meta-analyses and all of these other things and sort of accumulation, gradual accumulation of knowledge bits over time and and um, all the um, curation and cleanup and so on that sort of happens through that and, and never through any single study. So like, essentially, despite our best efforts to be rigorous with the application of all of these research methods that we discussed the entire semester, it's still hopeless because we can't ever hope to get anything out of a single study anyway, is what, what I'm hearing you say, Jenna. I mean, this is exactly the conclusion I had yeah. at the end of my intro to statistics class. This is the nature of doing statistics is you don't know the answer because you have to sample. Yeah, I kind of agree. I think it's just the nature of the work and that, I mean, and, the, and then just the results in this paper will change over time as, uh, as hopefully <laughs> we figure out diversity issues and the sample populations and the mentor relationships change over time. So there'll be, there'll be new data to analyze and gain insights from. So I think that it's, I don't know, it's just the nature of the work. And I think that we, I don't know, I guess 
I'm like, I have this internal tension where it's like, obviously like this one strikes a chord and it really pisses me off the way that the results came about. And, but I mean, also because I think their methodology is very flawed. Um, but also like, I can imagine even if they did it all right, there would be, and they came to some conclusion I disagreed with, I would be like really mad <laughs> if the results were out there, but I, I want them to be out there because I think that like, that's important. And I think maybe that's why it's like important to put it out there. So there's a discussion amongst different uh, people. It's, it's, it's a really hard thing. <laughs> I don't know the right answer. So let me play the um, uh, the other side's advocate uh, again. Does that mean that basically this entire semester we spent together learning about empirical methods was all for nothing? Because um, really, you know, uh, whether you do a, a super rigorous job with your studies or or not, uh, it, it doesn't matter anyway. It's only through the passage of time and through sort of this gradual accumulation of um, knowledge over time and curation by the community and so on that we conclude anything anyway so like what's the point of even trying to be rigorous with any individual study because we don't rely on an individual study ever anyway I mean I think it's on like I think that you shouldn't put out any I mean we it's not that we don't rely on it though like we rely on it in the context of other things and other studies but we do rely on it and I think in that way we should be responsible researchers and try to do the best of our ability in the context and scope that we're defining our work research in and so I joke that but like I, I use a little reaction to say yes that we shouldn't learn any of this but like I 100% agree we do because in the collective, we are relying on the results of the research. Uh, and so it should be as rigorous as possible. And yeah, I think that's all I have to say is like, yeah, so it, we rely on multiple studies, but we're still relying on the results from individual studies in the collective. And so there's a responsibility on us to be as rigorous as possible. I guess also the standards of academic integrity would probably dictates that we uh, be as um, rigorous as possible with everything we do rather than sort of knowingly put out flawed stuff that seems just yeah. ethically inappropriate at the very least. Cool. Well, so, um, <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Um, all right, so let's let's leave this one here. Uh, I think we've had a sort of entertaining and productive discussion. Um, I guess we have time for one more. I don't know if we have time for two more, but let's let's do one more. Which of the other two did you like the best, or did you find most controversial or interesting? Which should we discuss next? So one was this one where um, um, multiple researchers using the same data and hypothesis leads to very different conclusions. Uh, I think that was Bilbo. And the other one was the um, researcher bias, machine learning, and so on. That was maybe Ben. Um, which which of these two papers did you find most interesting? I think we will only have time for one of the two. CJ says, first one, the one with analyzing the same data, leading to different conclusions. OK, I hear some nods. So let's do that one. Bobo, you're up. OK, let me share my slide. Mm. OK, hello, everyone. I'm Hombo. Uh, today, I'm going to present this paper observing many researchers using the same data and hypothesis review a hidden universe uh, of data analysis. And as Bogdan said, it's basically saying that researchers using the same data and study the same problem with the same hypothesis leads to different conclusions. So as usual, before I get into the details of this paper, I will have a brief background introduction. So first of all, 
Uh, I do research in computational social science, which is basically we use computational techniques to study social science and social phenomena. But just like any kind of social science research, computational social science is not an exception. It's generally very hard to find consensus among researchers. And it's very, very difficult for us to conclude anything, just like when people interpret uh, the figure or the graph uh, on the left, that different people can have their own interpretations. So because of the difficulty to draw conclusions, even those simple questions in social science uh, are unanswered. Uh, those questions include whether going to an ivory university brings you higher income compared to going to a less prestigious university like a state school or that where the use of social medias make people mentally healthier or less healthy, or whether use of social media make people more politically polarized or not. So those are the kind of questions that are relatively well defined. And you might imagine it should be easy to answer because uh, the data are easily accessible and we seem to have a lot of method approach models on hand to answer those questions. But it turns out that researchers have been arguing about the answer to these questions for tens of years, and we still haven't find a consensus. So why is it so hard to draw conclusions? You can probably think of many explanations. I list several. For example, researchers may rely on different data sets to study the same question. Or researchers might use different models to study the same question. Or researchers might employ different metrics to measure the same concepts that listed in those questions. So all these questions are uh, just like the subjective decisions, subjective interpretations we just described, that it leads um, to different conclusions. So is it possible that we can fix all those problems that we just described or discussed? And then it will lead to a more consensus conclusions among researchers. So if we know researchers use or, uh, rely on different data set, we can ask them to use the same data set. If they use a different model, we, use, we ask them to use the same model. And if they use different metrics, we convince them to use the same metrics. I'm not joking, but the first day I come to CMU, I really, when I was reading all these kind of liter uh, literature reviews starting the same question, I really, I really wish they used the same method on the same data set so all their results are comparable and easy to understand. But after I think about it, I know it's not feasible. There are a lot of practical limitations. For example, uh, that we have to use different, we have to sample from different populations because uh, that pe uh, people in different countries on different side of the world are different. Uh, so that by sampling from uh, uh, more people that we can make the, the, the rules or the patterns we observe more universal and our result are more representative of the entire populations. Or it could be that some data uh, are not, um, the researchers can't just share the data because of privacy reasons or something like that. But let's take a step back. Just assuming there's no such limitations, assuming we have a way to fix all those problems as we said uh, in this slides, can we find a consensus doing research? So this is the, focal question of this paper. To put it more formally, giving the same research question, hypothesis, data set, operationalization of variables, where the conclusions becoming at least similar? That's the focal question. I will give you five seconds to think about the answer of this question yourself, and I will walk you through the details of this research and their result. Yes? Oh, no. we, we know the title of the paper, so we know where this is going. Okay, just assuming you don't know. Or you can keep a certain level of criticism to the result. <laughs> okay, so considering that you have an answer yourself, uh, let's get to the experiment. So at a high level, it's basically the author invites a bunch of researchers to conduct the same research with the same data set, similar method, all, this, all the other things that also can continue to be similar and the author wants them to report the result. More specifically, they also invite 162 researchers or I would call them participants in the study 
and uh, they formed 73 teams, research teams. The key questions they are going to ask is whether more immigration uh, reduced support uh, for six given social policies. That's the key questions that all those 73 teams are going to answer. And to make the research settings more similar among those teams, to also specifically ask those teams to replicate a previous paper which specifically studies this question uh, whether more immigration reduced support for six given policies. And in that original paper that they are about to replicate, that the paper uh, provides the data set they use and the analytical stata code uh, that they use to analyze the data. And all the researchers are asked specifically to follow the steps described in the original paper and use the same data set used in the original paper, the same and the same analytical code. And they want to test whether they can lead to the same conclusion as the original paper or not. Specifically about the models, there are two key independent variables. One is the percentage of immigration in, the, in a region. And the second is the net number or total number of immigration in that region, uh, plus a bunch of control variables. And the major key dependent variables is that they have a survey to collect uh, people's opinions about six uh, social welfare policies, whether they like it or not. And this is the key dependent variables that they want to predict or they want to fit. And all participants in this study need to submit uh, the models they used in their research and a substantive conclusions of their research. That's the material they must provide. So the author received all the uh, results that uh, the participants report and they drawn plots uh, to summarize their result. So this graph is the, the measured effect size reported by all research teams. In total, we have 73 research teams. Most of them provide 12 models per team. Uh, the number 12 is because we have two independent variables and six outcome variables. Uh, so two times six is 12. So 12 models per each group. Uh, but some uh, research groups insist they need to provide more models because they have different in interpretation about the result. Uh, so that in total, they have 1,200 models in total. And the X, X, they order the models based on the reported effective, uh, effect size of the, uh, of the in independent variables, or you can call it the estimate, the coefficient of independent variables in their model. Uh, and the x-axis in this graph is the ordered index of the model. And the y-axis in this graph is the average marginal effect or the estimated coefficient of independent model, independent variables in the model. And you can see that about one third or one fourth of all the models that is reported there was a negative effect uh, of the independent uh, variables, which means that the more immigration, uh, the less uh, support that uh, the entire population would have for the policy. And around 60% of all the models that report a not significant effect, which means that uh, how many immigrations you have has nothing to do with the overall uh, support or opinion about this policy. And about uh, 16, 70% of the models reported there was a positive effect. And you can see the, the scale of that effect also varies a lot. Uh, this one actually is minus 0.5 uh, and some one is zero and this one is uh, positive 0.5. So both the direction of the model and the effect size of the model varies a lot. So, why did it so that after we have controlling for all those things, like the, the data set that they use, the analytical code they use, and the, the, uh, the, met, uh, the steps they use, we can control for all this, we still don't have a consensus. Why is that? One hypothesis from the author is that 
there are still some subjective subjective decisions made by the authors that may by the participants that may affect the outcome. Uh, those include uh, the choice of independent variables, like which uh, or choice of independent and control variables, which control variables do you want to include in your model, or potential subsetting of the data. Do you want to subset uh, a select a small set of the data to conduct your experiment, or that you want to use the entire data set? And how do you subsect subsect the data? So those are kind of a subjective decisions that participants may make. So what the author did is that they examined the research process uh, for, all the, uh, research, uh, for all the participants and they code the subjective decisions made in their research. So it's basically use a dummy variables um, to indicate what decisions you made. Some people they use the four data set, it might be uh, one dummy variables to indicate all those teams use four data set. And if they don't use the four data set, you only use half the data set, it may be another variable, another dummy variable indicated you use half of the data set, something like that. So in total, they code 107 um, subjective decisions. And then um, that, that's, they think uh, uh, have captured most of the subjective decisions made by the participants in this research. And what they did, is that they try to explain the variance of the research conclusions based uh, with a regression model based on the independent variables, which is first, uh, the subjective decisions made by those researchers. And second is some researcher characteristics indicate like what, uh, what are the past, indicates the past research method, the, the past research expertise of those participants. So the, their hypothesis is that researchers that used to uh, use different kind of uh, approaches may produce different results. So they have a variable indicates what are the characteristics of those researchers. So they want to see whether we use those things, uh, the decisions they made and the characteristics of these researchers. Can we predict uh, or can we explain the conclusions drawn by the research? and the report they factor size. And uh, uh, if most of the variable variance in the dependent variables uh, are predicted by the independent variables that they conclude that um, they have captured the most of the uh, factors that can affect the conclusions made by the research. Interestingly, that their conclusion was there are too much variance unexplained when drawing up uh, conclusions based on the models they, uh, they just built. So here they have four outcome variables. Uh, this one is basically a subjective uh, conclusion. So they, they, um, they use the direction of the outcome, uh, the direction of the conclusion as the outcome, whether it's uh, significantly positive, significantly negative, no significant effect. And the, the other three are the size of the effect, estimates the effect. And for all those models, you can see that they, um, they have different um, subjective decisions. Uh, this one was assigned, um, this one is not, not that relevant. So for, for example, this one uh, that they control for the research design, the kind of measurement they use, uh, how do they select the sample to run their model and how do we specify the model? So these are all the hard code subjective decisions that is in, including the model. And it turns out that all these variables that they include only explain something like 10 to 20% uh, of the entire uh, total variance in the research in the researcher's conclusion, which is basically saying that a lot of the conclusions, uh, a lot of the difference in conclusions are explained by something we don't know yet. So we don't know what leads to these conclusions, but they exist what leads to those different conclusions, but they do exist. That's basically the, the, all the results that reported by this research. Okay, so um, that's actually the, everything I want to discuss about the, the paper. I do have some discussions. Uh, certainly you probably have your own questions and thoughts, but the part I want to focus on is uh, how much we can trust about uh, social science results overall. And I want to share three 
of my thoughts or my experience on this. So first of all, I want to introduce that there is actually an ongoing research to specifically study um, how much confident we can put uh, when it comes to a social science um, result. Uh, so there was a project, I believe it's one of the pioneering projects that's specifically studying this field. And this is also one of the projects I have participated in when I was an undergrad. It was a project initiated by DARPA. Uh, and in their project description, they specifically say that the ground truth program aims to improve knowledge of social science modeling uh, capacities and limitations. And what they did is that they have a sim they create a simulated world, uh, which are basically saying that they have a world and they have people in this world, they have um, entities, social events in this world. Everything looks just the, just the same as a real world. But the only problem is that uh, the how individuals act and behave are controlled by some algorithms, which are designed by another research team. And what we do as a researcher or participant in this program is to uh, uncover the rules that agents follow in this hidden world. So because the traditional problem when people want to understand the social science is that we don't know what the ground truth is. So we can't validate, we can't really validate uh, our result because we don't have the ground truth. But in this program, we know the ground truth because the ground truth is provided by another team. They're just like the god of this world and they create this world and they know exactly how this world rules, runs. And we just to uncover what's uh, going on there. And um, a, a probably more detailed report about the, the overall conclusion of this result. But uh, my impression about the participant as the participants of the, the, the program is just that overall, um, the quality of the result, uh, how much you can learn about the rules in the world really just depends a lot on the subjective interpretation uh, and it's on the subjective interpretation and the subjective judgment of the researchers. And it, it's more surprisingly that it seems those advanced methods used by us, like social network analysis, machine learning models, seems to be seems to produce no better result than some intuitive ideas, like just to grab some data and manually observe the patterns and try to infer what are the patterns. So there is no advanced techniques, but just the human observation and human inference can produce no less, no worse result than some advanced techniques. That's just my impression of, the, of this uh, work. Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. Just uh, looking at the time, uh, being mindful of that, could you try to wrap up? Oh, OK. Yeah, if you want to wrap up, I think that's basically everything about the, except I have something I can share the slides later. My, my take home from this is that it's even more hopeless than it seemed after reading the first paper. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what you, the rest of you think. Even if you fix everything, but the researchers, you still get so completely different results and conclusions. Anna says doing our best is better than doing nothing. I think I agree with that. But you know, just when we thought that we were converging on, on these super rigorous research methods and robust study designs and so on and mixed methods wherever possible and all of, all of these great things, um, we're finding that it, it still doesn't matter.
okay so let's let's stop here i'm looking for um uh, slightly more optimism on thursday hopefully we we end this on a brighter note it, it seems pretty grim from uh, the discussion today so let's let's try to do um ben's paper on thursday and hopefully kyle can walk us through the drama with the other uh, the other study uh, there's a lot to unpack there so you know feel free to uh, extract the bits that are you think are most dramatic or interesting and we could focus on those okay all right so th thanks a lot this was a really enjoyable discussion i will see you all on thursday <laughs>